Um, so I came across uh, the, this topic of Polish topologies, uniqueness, um, by because there are, there are some connections with what, what I usually do. Uh, I came across it um, uh, eight years ago. And just recently, by a coincidence, I, I came back to this topic. And uh, so I'm going to talk about it. But um, yeah, I would like to say that uh, I'm not uh, really an expert in this. So if I miss, miss uh, cite something, uh, something, for example, if I say somebody proved something and it was some, somebody else, then please correct me also if I say a wrong mathematical statement. Yeah? This could be. Um, <clears throat> okay, so um, how is this uh, talk uh, structured? I, I'm, I'm going to do two parts. Um, so uh, if you if you have uh, heard enough, you can leave after the first one. And I heard then there's a break, right? Then I give a second uh, part where where there are more details. So in the first uh, part, I just want to motivate um, this kind of uh, uh, topic, uh, this line of research and um, present some results, also some new ones. Um, more precisely, I'll talk about structures that carry an al algebraic and a topological uh, uh, structure. Um, and um, I talk about the, the relationship between uh, these two structures. In particular, I'll talk about automorphism groups, endomorphism monoids, and polymorphism clones. I'll explain what it is, um, which carry the, these both kinds of structure naturally. Um, then I'll, I'll, I'll quickly talk about the connection to, to theoretical computer science. Um, and in the end, I'm going to present a grand table with uh, some of the results that have been obtained in the past. In the second part, uh, I, I uh, give uh, some, some counter examples, some things that are obviously false uh, uh, to motivate the methods. Um, of, uh, for monoids and clones. Yeah, I, I won't like prove anything new about groups, but only new things about uh, monoids and clones. And present some old methods uh, and some uh, the new method that we found uh, last year uh, for these objects. Okay, so um, let me first uh, start with the motivation. This is just uh, very simple uh, stuff. Um, so many mathematical objects carry naturally uh, both an algebraic structure and a topological structure, um, which are uh, compatible. So in the sense that the algebraic operations of the structure are continuous with you know, respect to the topological structure. Okay, so yeah, some uh, easy examples, the, the group of the additive group of the reals, the group structure, and of course the topology of the reals. The additive group uh, on, on on R two the square of the reals. It's another topological group. Um, and vector spaces over the reals or the complex numbers are of course subsets, more or less of uh, powers of the reals or the complex numbers or indeed any field. Okay, and so whatever whatever topology you might have in in the field. Um, you can take the uh, product topology. So the vector space naturally carries a product topology. Um, so this is even the case if, if, if your field is, is not a real, but say uh, discrete, yeah? And uh, you get the topology of pointwise conversions. The, the elements of the vector space are functions, right? And um, a function, a sequence of functions converges to another function if, uh, point, if it converges pointwise, that is for every for every argument of the function sequence um, obtain, uh, takes the, the value of the, of the limit at that argument eventually for large enough n. Okay. Um, the, uh, if, if we look at the automorphism group of the rationals, it's a very nice group, um, carries, um, it's, it's a subset of the rational, uh, it, it's a set of functions from the rationals to themselves, so it carries uh, product topologies, whatever you equip the rationals, whatever topology you equip the rationals with, in particular if you equip it with the discrete topology, then you get again this pointwise convergence topology, which will be the most important one for us. Uh, and this this works in general. You don't need rational numbers for this. If you um, have any uh, first order structure A, 
um, then its automorphism group naturally, um, it's a group and it naturally carries the topology of pointwise convergence. Yeah? So A is just taken to be discrete and A to the A functions from A to the A, from A to A um, um, get this, get this uh, uh, topology. Um, so this you probably uh, have already seen. Um, what is less uh, studied are endomorphism monoids or embedding monoids uh, of uh, first order structures. So if A is a first order structure, then the set of endomorphisms, so homomorphisms from A into itself, um, are um, a subset of A to the A. So they carry, uh, they're a monoid, they're closed under composition, they have the identity function, and um, they have the pointwise uh, convergence topology. Uh, embedding monoids, by an embedding, I just mean a uh, uh, a strong endomorphism in the sense that it preserves uh, relations and also the negations of the relations. Um, or uh, if you take the automorphism group, this is just to confuse you a bit, if you take the automorphism group of a first order structure and you take its closure, of course, you, uh, you say um, automorphism group is a closed group, but uh, it's not closed as a subset of A to the A uh, in the space of the bare space, uh, space of all functions from A to itself. It's not closed. For example, if, if you take the group of all, or the, the full sym symmetric group, the closure of it in, in uh, N to the N is, uh, is the set of all injective functions. Right? Um, then this is a this is a, this is a monoid, yeah, and it carries a monoid structure, semigroup structure, and uh, pointwise convergence. Yeah. Um, so if A is an omega categorical, then this is just the elementary embeddings. <clears throat> and now the thing that you have probably never seen, unless <sighs> we've met before, or <laughs> you have uh, by some uh, coincidence ended up in a universal algebra conference. A clone, what is a clone? Uh, the polymorphism clone of a structure. This is a further generalization of the endomorphism monoid. It's a set of all functions from finite powers of the structure into the structure itself. Okay, not just from A to A, but A to the N uh, to A, where N can be arbitrary finite, um, which preserve the structure yeah, in, in the most natural sense. Yeah. We don't need to go into details. It's not so important now. But there's, uh, this is a, a natural thing. This is a, an algebraic structure. Uh, it has uh, given by composition, just like for the endomorphism monoid, okay, which is called a clone. It's now not so important. But anyway, um, the again, uh, the functions in in this in this polymorphism clone, they can they are equipped with the point topology of pointwise convergence. In functions, these elements, they are functions from A to the N to A, so they get the product topology where A is uh, discrete. Sorry, can I ask a question? Yeah. Can, can you, for example, in case of groups or monoids, what you mean by preserving the structure if you have a function from A squared to A? Yeah, uh, so A squared to A, uh, it means that when, uh, or in general, I can write it in general, if you, if you, uh, so you have a function from A to the N to A, okay, so and say R is a L array relation, okay, then whenever you take uh, tuples in R, L tuples in R, uh, N tuples in R. Okay, this, these are all in R. And you apply F to this, and you apply F just to every component. Yeah, then the result must be in R. Okay. Okay, so in, in the case of an endomorphism monoid, there's just, um, so if, if f is just a unary function, then f of, of one tuple, f is just a, has just one argument, f of one tuple must, be, must give a tuple in R, okay? And now mm -hmm. you apply it to several tuples, like row-wise in this, uh, where, how, in the way I, I, I drew. Mm -hmm. 
So in, in uh, uh, say, if the structure is the rationals with the normal order, okay, then uh, uh, a binary or let's, uh, for less confusion, because the relation here is already binary, let's say, uh, say a 100 array uh, polymorphism is just a, a, a function from Q to the 100 to Q, which is uh, monotonous, yeah, strictly monotonous, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So whenever you, you plug in pairs that are related, to where x is smaller than y in, in each of the pairs, and you apply the function to, to the smaller ones and you apply it to the bigger ones, then the, the result, the first result is smaller than the second. Okay. No. But yeah, so we won't go into tec technical details. Yeah, so um, it's not, not, um, you can imagine that that you can find come up with a natural notion. And, um, uh, the only important thing is, of course, every such set a to the a to the n is uh, equipped with the pointwise convergence. But here, this pole of a it's a subset of the union of all these, right? So how what, what do we dis, uh, what topology do we put? Well, we say that each of these sort yeah, the n re functions in pole a are a clopen set for every n. Yeah, so. Uh, the, the unary are not topologically uh, connected to the to the binary ones. Yeah. Um, okay, and in general, I mean, this is nothing else. In the end, what is this pole of A? This is functions, finitary functions on a set A. Yeah. Uh, so this is nothing else than than algebra. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, you, in a sense, every algebra is of that form. Yeah. So an, an algebra is, is equipped with the algebraic structure of composition of the functions. That's what, what you usually study in universal algebra. And, um, and the functions have the topology of pointwise convergence. OK. So and yeah, we'll be interested in these this kind of uh, objects. So how much choice uh, can there be for the topologies? Yeah? So given, given your favorite algebraic ob object, how much choice is there for the topology? Well, sometimes it can be unique. So for example, we know from functional analysis that the vector space r to the n, okay, finite dimensional vector space over the reals, uh, has a unique Hausdorff topology. Yeah, there's, not, there's just no choice. And sometimes there, there is choice. For example, the, the additive group of the reals is uh, isomorphic, of course, to the, well, it's isomorphic to the additive group on r2, okay, algebraically. So that's the same group but they are not topologically isomorphic, as you can see if you leave away one point. So in fact, on this group, you have infinitely many possible uh, topologies. Huh? So sometimes there is choice for the topology of an algebraic object. So uh, the general question is, what are uh, or natural uh, question, general question is, what are the compatible topologies for a given, say, your favorite algebraic object? Okay, and this is actually a very old question. Um, um, for example, was an old question uh, whether there is an infinite non-topologizable group that is a, a group that has only the, the discrete and uh, trivial topologies uh, as compat compatible topologies. Okay, and it was an old question that was uh, answered positively. So there is such a group, um, first by Scheler uh, under CH, then without CH was but uncountable, and then Olshansky. Which cardinality does it have this group? So uh, in in the end, uh, in the end, uh, countable. Ah, there is a countable. Yeah, yeah. Non. Uh, yeah. So so first, Scheler found an uncountable under CH. Then uh, then the CH was removed, um, but it was still uncountable, and um, then there's a, a countable. Yeah. Nice. Um, so this is a very old question. Yeah. So this is a question, a kind of question that that mathematicians have been asking for, for uh, well, at least a, a, a century. Yeah. Um, and uh, an, uh, so in the light of this question, you can, uh, a similar question is, well, uh, can it be that there's a unique, say you, you don't want a discrete topology, you don't want a trivial topology, can there be a, but can there be a unique uh, non-trivial, non-discrete topology for your paper? Can this, can this be the case? Yeah. The algebraic structure is so strong that it allows only one uh, 
like proper uh, topology. And um, you can uh, ask variants of this question um, by making assumptions on the topology. Okay, maybe you 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 want for, are not just happy with this, but you want it to be, at least to be a Hausdorff or or a Polish yeah, in particular. Polish is of course uh, strong, so a Polish I just state for the uh, sake of completeness uh, is separable and uh, completely metrizable. It comes from a complete metric. It's a countable then subset. And uh, an example is this uh, pointwise convergence on, um, on the symmetry group uh, or on the bare space on the set of all functions from, from the natural numbers to themselves, or also for these polymorphism clones, the set of all finitary functions on the, on the natural numbers. Yeah? This is a Polish topology. Okay, and we'll, we'll really be interested in Polish topologies. Okay, so let's first look at uh, Polish groups. Um, we've seen already the example, yeah, that, uh, uh, that um, the groups of additive group of the reals and the additive group of the square of the reals are algebraically isomorphic, but not, uh, not the topologically. Um, on the other hand, uh, why, why is that the case? Um, I mean, why they're isomorphic? Because they're vectors, uh, vector spaces of the same dimension uh, over the over the um, rationals. Yeah, but of course, uh, um, uh, to find the basis for this, you you need uh, the exam of choice. Yeah. So on the other hand, um, uh, so in a sense, this this fact here, it it can be seen as a uh, pathological. Yeah. Uh, because uh, on the other hand, we know that uh, it is consistent with CF, yeah, without choice, um, that any Polish group has a unique uh, Polish topology. Huh? <laughs> um, and in, in another uh, like classical result is uh, is the following fact: it, it can be that there's no uh, non-discrete Polish topology. For example, three groups have no uh, non-discrete. Uh, Polish topology. So uh, another old question um, for a concrete uh, concrete uh, group um, was also well, I guess from the forties or so, um, um, the thirties, uh, by Ulam, um, who asked uh, at the time whether the symmetric group on the natural numbers ha can have a, uh, a locally compact Polish uh, topology. Okay. Um, so uh, the pointwise convergence is, is is not locally compact. Yeah? So we know we know it has the well one topology we see immediately is pointwise convergence, uh, but can it also have um, a locally compact Polish uh, topology? And the answer is no. In fact, every T one topology on uh, on uh, on the full symmetric group on the natural numbers must contain the pointwise convergence uh, topology. And it is a folklore effect that if you have two um, two topologies, uh, both Polish uh, on a group that uh, are uh, comparable, so one is contained in the other one, then they must be equal. So there, therefore, from this it follows that uh, the pointwise uh, uh, convergence topology is the unique Polish topology on the symmetric group. Okay. In fact, it's the unique uh, separable. Um, uh, topology, uh, more recent result by uh, Rosenthal and Solecki. Um, okay, so um, so the the symmetric group has this uniqueness property. Um, uh, does it hold for other structures? And well, there, there has been industry of <laughs> of uh, proving this for for uh, many nice structures. Um, have this property, for example, the isometry uh, group of the Eurison space or the Eurison bounded Eurison space, uh, the Eurison sphere, um, homeomorphism groups of the Hilbert cube or the Cantor set, um, the automorphism group of the rationals, and the automorphism group of the random graph. Okay, they all have unique uh, Polish topologies. Okay, so um, it is difficult, for, like the summary of this is. Uh, it is difficult actually for a group to to um, have uh, several uh, Polish topologies. So, Michael, when you have the small index property, then you automatically have a unique Polish group topology. Is this the case? Um, I, 
I, I don't think uh, maybe some someone can correct me if, if it's wrong, but I don't think this this follows automatically. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, that's that's why I wrote um, this. Uh, so if, if you have ample uh, uh, generics, then uh, you have a unique uh, Polish topology. Yeah. Right. Okay. I see. Well, also that's not continued. No. Okay. It's not necessary. It might be sufficient, but I see. Yeah, because I also knew this result that is consistent with the ZF that any Polish Archimedean Polish group had uh, the the small index topology. But I see. I, I I see. I see. It's not exactly the same. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. So um, so for groups, it's very difficult to have um, uh, several. But group structures are of course very strong. Yeah. And uh, vector, as we've seen, the vec vector space structures are even stronger. Yeah? How about semi-groups? Yeah, so they, uh, or clones, they have less structure. Actually, the difference between semi-groups and clones is, is, is not very big yeah? in, in my intuition and uh, in the results I've seen so far. So you can uh, mostly think about just semi-groups. Yeah? Um, but semi-groups, of course, that's much weaker algebraic structure than a group structure. And um, what, do we, what do we know? Well, this this is a much more uh, recent uh, that people have even uh, thought about this, yeah. And you see, for these uh, these uh, like um, most natural uh, uh, semi groups, let's say, or among the most natural uh, in this context, um, this has was proven like uh, two years ago that the the semi group of all functions from the natural numbers to themselves. Uh, do have a unique uh, Polish topology, okay, and the, the the clone of all finitary functions on on the countable infinite set also has a unique Polish topology, okay. Um, however, um, you don't need the exam of choice to to um, get more topologies. So here we uh, by this was actually by the same authors. Um, um, they found that if you take the monoid, uh, the semi-group of all injective functions on a countable set, yeah, so which uh, I mentioned this before is nothing else than the closure of the automorphism of the full symmetric group uh, on a countable set uh, in the pointwise convergence. Okay. Um, this this monoid or this semigroup has actually infinitely many Polish topologies, yeah? uh, and this is very uh, simple. So actually, the small it has the smallest one, which is just the pointwise convergence. So which is of course uh, the a basis for this topology are the sets of the form all functions which uh, for uh, for values x and, and y uh, natural numbers x and y all functions which send x to y. This is a uh, Subbasis for this topology, okay, and it actually, as it turns out, has the largest Polish topology. Namely, um, you have to add to these uh, to these uh, sets um, uh, further open sets uh, of the following form: the set of all functions which don't take a particular value, okay, which skip a particular value, um, and uh, Sets uh, of all functions which uh, which skip uh, which uh, don't hit a certain number of uh, values. Okay, and this number can be finite or infinite. Okay, so these you may also make these sets open sets. You generate the topology, and this this is a uh, Polish uh, semigroup topology for this for this um, semigroup. Yeah. Um, okay, and uh, so that's already two different ones and actually there are infinitely many just by restricting uh, allowing only a certain certain ends yeah but uh, like bound them yeah so it, you, you only put uh, let's say uh, m0 m1 and m2 yeah into the topology okay so this gives you countably many um, uh, to polish topologies okay and this, it's not known if these are all or there's there's no classification yeah so from this you see, okay, it can happen. Uh, so in in some cases there is a unique one, but it can also easily happen without any fancy um, uh, construction. Yeah, this is uh, very elementary. Um, that that there are more topologies, even infinitely many. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, 
I would like to give a bit of motivation why at all to study this. I mean, I guess the fact that this historically this was such a popular uh, question and uh, the results are nice, the methods are nice. Um, so this is enough like abstract uh, reasons to, to study this. Yeah? But uh, I would like to, to mention some more reasons. Um, well, so first of all, I think that, that it gives us, I mean, uh, studying this, it, it gives us insight into the relationship between the two structures and therefore the structure that we actually actually study, the object we actually study. But actually also, I think there, I mean, there are, I know there are also practical reasons to study this, how, you know, how much the topology is determined by the, the algebraic structure. Because even if a topology is, turns out to be irrelevant, what do I mean by irrelevant? Event? I mean, it's uniquely determined. So in, in a sense, uh, why do you even consider it? Because it's, it's already given by the algebraic structure. Yeah? But uh, even if that's the case, then it might be so, and actually it usually is, for non-trivial reasons. Yeah? So uh, proving that the, the topology is unique is usually very difficult. Yeah? So uh, a knowledge of this fact that it is, uh, that is unique is uh, you can use this knowledge, yeah. So you you have you know something more uh, about the structure. Um, so I would like to give some examples of of this, uh, first uh, very general ones and then more concrete ones of how to use this. So um, if A and B are countable omega categorical structures, then um, we know it's a theorem of uh, Alpant and Ziegler. This is not very hard. Uh, if uh, that the two structures are first order by interpretable. Okay, so they, they 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 can interpret one another in such a way that if you um, compose the two interpretations, you more or less get back to your original structure. They are by interpretable, so more or less the same in some sense. Uh, if their uh, automorphism groups are isomorphic as topological groups, so this uh, this pink here is always topological. Okay, if we know that uh, a has a unique Polish topology, well, then this is, of course, the case if and only if they are isomorphic as, as uh, abstract groups. Yeah? So, and it might be easier, it might be easier to show, for example, that uh, something, uh, that two groups uh, cannot be isomorphic by showing they cannot be topologically isomorphic, yeah? if you know um, that, uh, that the topology is, is, is unique. Yeah? So this, this might really be a practical advantage because usually the fact that this is the same is, is a complicated fact that's hard to show. Uh, we have a similar thing um, uh, with uh, uh, endomorphism monoids and polymorphism clones. So there are uh, two omega categorical structures are existentially positively bi-interpretable. Okay, so that is a bi-interpretation that only uses existential positive uh, formulas yeah, rather than arbitrary first order formulas. If and only if their endomorphism monoids are topologically isomorphic and they are primitive positive by interpretable, that means uh, by interpretable where the first order form formulas used in the interpretation are only allowed to be primitive positive. Yeah? That means only conjunction and existential quantification if and only if their polymorphism clones are isomorphic as topological clones. Okay, so um, of course, at the moment, uh, you can wonder, yeah, why do I want to know if two structures are primitive positive by interpretable? I mean, um, who cares? Yeah? But I, I'm going to, this is actually how I came to this topic. I'm going to give you a, a, the reason why, why this is actually interesting. It's not interesting, certainly from a classical, uh, let's say, model theory point of view. This is not the logic you usually study, primitive positive, um, but it actually has a, a sense. Yeah? Um, okay, so uh, this is still a bit restricted, right? Because well, we're only talking about isomorphisms, yeah. Um, and not about uh, one structure interpreting the other one, which is maybe something we want to we are more often interested in. So that's why I want to present one of the reasons why I present, want to present the following variant of um, the topology being determined by the algebraic structure called automatic continuity. Um, so uh, at automatic continuity, it, uh, it is not always defined in the same way. I define it in a rather restricted 
uh, way, okay? Um, so I say uh, the automorphism group of a first order structure has automatic continuity if any homomorphism from this group into the symmetric group on the natural numbers is automatically continuous. Yeah? And I use the same uh, uh, notion for the endomorphism monoid and the polymorphism clone. Okay? And the uh, uh, endomorphism monoid is, of course, then mapped into uh, end to the end, the bare space, and the polymorphism clone into this uh, a clone of all finitary functions. Okay, so I use uh, automatic continuity in this restricted sense, um, because you can also say uh, some, some authors say it has automatic continuity whenever it, uh, if every mapping to let's say a separable um, topological group is continuous or so. Okay, so. I restrict to, the, to this particular group. Um, okay, and uh, what is the consequence uh, for for um, for uh, first order interpretations? Is the following: um, if we have a again as as before, if we have an omega categorical structure A, and uh, then another structure B has a first order interpretation in A, if uh, there is a continuous mapping from the automorphism group of A into the automorphism group of B. That's actually not quite correct what I say here. Yeah, so actually this, this, the, the image has to act with finitely many orbits. But, um, uh, this is not so important now. Yeah, morally, let's say it's correct. And uh, we have the similar statements for clones and, and, and endomorphism monads. Okay. Okay, so, so uh, with uh, continuous homomorphisms, we can we can use them to to interpret things, or they're equivalent to interpreting other, other structures. Yeah? So, and we we often want to know if some structure can can uh, interpret another structure. Yeah? So, first order, you probably you will probably believe me. Okay, that it's interesting if uh, one structure B has can be expressed in first order inter interpreted in a structure A. Is probably uh, going to believe me, but maybe you say, okay, I don't care why if b has a pp primitive positive interpretation a or not yeah so i can understand that you might not necessarily um relate to this yeah so that's why i wrote here okay um but who cares about pol of a or who cares about pp interpretations yeah? and i want to talk about this only uh, for one one uh, page yeah, I want to tell you my personal story, why I actually studied this, uh, came to this topic. Yeah, because as I said in the beginning, it's not what I do most of the time. But um, there was a very I came from something else, and there was a very concrete motivation to to consider these questions. Okay, so what's my personal story? I was working on computation. I'm still working actually on computational problems uh, of the following form. Okay. We have a relational structure A, okay, as before, and uh, in a finite signature, so uh, R1, Rm, yeah. So finitely many relations R1, Rm. This can be an infinite structure. In my case, it usually is. Then CSP of A, uh, CSP stands for the constraint satisfaction problem of A, is the following computational problem. You're given a sentence which is primitive positive in the language of A. So what is that primitive positive? Uh, it asks about the existence of elements such that a can conjunction of atomic formulas uh, holds, okay? So do there exist x1 to xn such that r i1 of these variables holds and r i2 of these variables holds and, 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 and? And the question is, you, you're supposed to answer is, is this sentence true in the structure? So can you find actually these values uh, satisfying this, this conjunction, okay? So why is it called constraint satisfaction problem? Well, you have to, what you have to do in this problem is you have to assign values to these variables in A, right? Uh, in such a way that all these constraints are satisfied, yeah? So these, these things here are called constraints, like this, okay? So uh, really, uh, it's like uh, solving a Sudoku. Yeah, uh, you, you're given um, some some variables. There's some empty fields, some constraints. Yeah, 
um, how you're allowed to put numbers. And um, the question is, uh, okay, so usually in a Sudoku, you, the question is not, is there a solution, but you just want to find it. Here the question is, is there a solution? And you can be given a huge Sudoku, not a nine times nine, but a huge Sudoku, is there a solution, okay? So you want to understand which uh, sets R, uh, I, L are satisfied uh, at the same time. So this is what you care. Well, what I care is, uh, I'm given this here. So this- Yeah, okay. Deciding all those is deciding which subsets of the index sets can be simultaneously realized or not. No, no, I no. want to know, okay. is, is, the whole, is the whole thing uh, uh, realizable? Is the, is yes. The, the, yeah. Uh, so yeah, you can you can say which, uh, but but this is not so much. I mean, there can be repetitions of these, right? There can be uh, R one of x one. Say R one is unary, okay? R one of x one and R one of x two and. R2. I, so uh, there, when you have variables, that the, the, they, they may be permutations of this sequence yes. x one x. Can be anything. So this can be ah okay. So it was a little. I see. X2. And the other can be the the, the right. x1, ah, see, x3, see. x1. Okay, thank you, thank whatever. you. Whatever. I see. No, that's not the yeah, in fact. Now I see better. Yeah. And of course, uh, the the more the longer the sentence becomes, the the, the harder it comes to to somehow decide this. Yeah, if if these the things that are written here are contradictory or not. Okay. Now, we we won't go, I mean, I won't uh, go into details, yeah. But um, I can tell you just a few facts about this kind of problem. So first of all, every computational problem, so every abstract computational problem, so a subset of uh, zero, one uh, strings, yeah, uh, can be modeled as CSP of a structure, OK? So can be modeled, uh, I mean, as polynomial time equivalent, OK? So really, this is all computational problems are, in a sense, constraint satisfaction problems. OK. Now, uh, examples, uh, I gave the ex a very informal uh, example of a Sudoku, but uh, another example would be uh, the CSP, if we look at a concrete structure, the CSP of the rationals within uh, with the normal order. Yeah? So you're given a sentence, they exist x1, xn, and then, uh, and then you have to use the language of, of the rational. So this says x1 smaller than x2, and x2 smaller than x3, and x2 smaller than uh, x4 and x4 smaller than x1 say yeah okay you have to decide is, is this uh, satisfiable or not yeah and um, well when is it satisfiable if and only if uh, you can see the the input here as a graph right um, as a directed graph and it has a solution if and only if you're not asking for a cycle yeah because a cycle you cannot satisfy this in so this is really the acyclicity problem of a of a finite digraph yeah? directed graph uh, classical uh, computational problem that's solvable in polynomial time yeah? um, another classical uh, problem is if you take q with the betweenness relation okay the betweenness ternary betweenness relation says about x y z that y is between x and z in the usual order okay so in an instance of this problem you're given variables and then some triples okay which say, okay, this has to be between this and this, and uh, and this has to be between this and this, and so on. Okay, it's the solution. Okay, this is the uh, problem that, that was considered already in the seventies, yeah? and this kind of uh, complexity theory was uh, was started properly, um, and uh, this uh, classical NP complete problem. Okay. Now, what we want is in CSPs, we want algebraic tools to distinguish uh, the complexities. Yeah, so we want uh, to see a difference between this CSP and this one. Yeah, why is this solvable in polynomial time? And this is uh, NP complete. Yeah? Unless P equals NP, these are, have different complexities. Yeah? So we want algebraic tools somehow. Okay, and now we know because the input is of this form, the input is uh, primitive positive. It is easy to see that if a structure B has a PP interpretation in A, so a first order interpretation just by primitive positive formulas, then um, this means A can express B in a certain sense. And this means that the CSP of A is at least as hard as the CSP of B or 
CSP of B reduces in polynomial time to CSP of A. Okay. And as I said before, this is the case if and only if there is a continuous mapping from pole of A to pole of B. Yeah. Okay. So that's why we are interested in continuous mappings. Okay. Now, uh, one important uh, thing that we ask all the time in there is can a can a structure a pp interpret this particular structure which i call sat yeah okay and this structure lives on a two element set on a just on a set zero one and it has just one relation which a ternary relation which says about a triple xyz that exactly one of them is one and the other two the uh, other two are two uh, are zero yeah okay so an important, as it turns out, an important question is for a, for a given A, can it interpret this structure? Yeah, and this structure, this the CSP of this is NP har, NP complete. Yeah, and the polymorphism clone of this structure, it's just projections on zero one. So this is a very rigid structure. It has no polymorphisms except for, uh, finitary projections. Yeah? Okay, so if a structure can interpret this one, then its CSP is at least NP hard yeah okay so the question is uh can what happens if it does not interpret this it this, this structure and this is if and only if there's no continuous mapping from this into the into this into this fixed thing yeah? okay but for and what we usually want to show is well if there's such a mapping we know the, the problem is cnp hard we usually want to show if there's no such mapping then it's solvable in polynomial time okay so given this fact, yeah, there's no continuous mapping, we want to come up with an algorithm for a CSP of A, okay? Uh, but topological facts, facts, I mean, they're not very good to use in an algorithm, yeah? So what we want is really algebraic consequences of in, in Paul of A of this fact, yeah? But this fact is a topolo topological and um, algebraic effect. So we want to get rid of the topology in this. Yeah, we want an algebraic reason why this doesn't happen. Yeah. And actually, so, uh, uh, so this is not true exactly as stated. You need more assumptions, but uh, uh, just to, to give you an idea, very often, uh, if, if, if this is the case, then actually there is an algebra, purely algebraic consequence. There are there is a six array function in in Paul of A and unary function, functions E and F, such that this particular uh, equation holds. Yeah? And then with this equation you can do stuff. Okay, so this is uh, just a short uh, like side uh, thing. How I came to this, I really came to this 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 uh, this whole problem of getting rid of the topology um, because of this. Yeah. Um, because that's what we have to do to understand the, uh, the computational complexity of such uh, uh, computational problems. Okay, so I won't talk about this anymore. Um, let's get back to reconstruction. Um, so what we want, um, this was all the motivation. Now what we want, we, we only consider uh, countable structures A that are omega categorical, and we want to reconstruct the topology of the automorphism group of A the endomorphism of A and of the polymorphism clone of A. Okay, and we consider the following notions. Um, yeah, Gianluca already asked about the, the connection be between these because there there are several notions that come up naturally. Yeah? So one we already I mentioned in the in the motivation is that there's a that the the pointwise con uh, convergence topology is the unique Polish topology. Okay, I call this. This kind of reconstruction UP, um, there's just one Polish topology on this. Okay, another one I already mentioned is every mapping from odd A or end A or, or pole A into the, the natural object, a full symmetric group or a bare space or this uh, generalized uh, bare space is continuous. This is called uh, automatic continuity, we already mentioned. Then there's a weaker, there's a weaker notion where you don't look at arbitrary homomorphisms, but just at isomorphisms, okay? So uh, this is called automatic homeomorphicity, which is uh, every isomorphism from odd A to the automorphism group of uh, another structure B uh, is a homeomorphism auto automatically, yeah? 
Same for endomorphous monoids and polymorphism clones. Okay, this makes sense as well. This is not uh, really, uh, was not really studied for groups. There's a reason for this because it's implied by automatic continuity. Um, but uh, it, it actually, we invented it uh, for monoids and clones because there, that's all we could prove. We could never prove automatic continuity. Okay. Um, and then there's a, a, another uh, thing that you can consider and that Gianluca has considered a lot, uh, which is uh, a strengthening of this again. So this is weaker than automatic continuity, but you can, uh, well, it's a variant, okay, which says that whenever you, you have such an isomorphism, okay, let's say from the automorphism group of A to the automorphism group of B, then this is induced by bijection uh, between, between the sets, yeah. So this is actually, you reconstruct not only the topology, um, but, um, but the, the, the action, the, the, not just the topological group, but the, the, the permutation group. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's another interesting concept that you uh, can consider. And uh, well, actually the connections between, they are not so clear, yeah? So a unique Polish topology implies automatic homeomorphicity, of course, because, uh, well, if you didn't have automatic homeomorphicity, you would have an isomorphism that is not a homeomorphism, and then pulling back the topology from the second structure to the first by, from uh, this isomorphism, you would get, would get two Polish topologies. Okay, so this is an implication that holds, but otherwise it's, um, okay, action reconstruction is actually stronger than automatic homeomorphicity. So there's also an implication there. If you can reconstruct the action, you can of course also reconstruct the topological group or a monad or whatever. But this action reconstruction, it usually, I mean, it only works uh, uh, if you restrict the range. B cannot just be any structure I and mean, it has to be a structure without algebraicity or something like this. But here you only consider omega categorical structures anyway. Yeah, I already, okay. yeah but then, you, yeah, yeah. you also need no algebraicity in general. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even in this paper that I have uh, oh, yeah. to have the reconstruction in all this a bit. But the, but, the context but, is omega categorical and yeah, then you have to make yeah. distinctions. Yeah, the yes. context is omega categorical. And of course, still, so there are some obvious uh, things. I mean, for edge action reconstruction, it's obvious that you have, you cannot just allow any B, yeah? otherwise it, it will just fail. Yeah. So, um, so morally we can still think, uh, okay, there's an implication whenever there can be uh, an implication. Yeah. And for groups, automatic continuity uh, implies automatic homomorphicity. Uh, so what's the difficulty here? Well, in automatic com continuity, we don't require, we just want that the mapping is continuous, but not that it's open, that the inverse is also continuous. Yeah? Uh, but for groups, this is automatically the case. Yeah? For Polish groups, this is all automatically the case. Um, but this is not the case for, uh, for monoids, or we don't actually know uh, if it's the case for monoids. Yeah? So for groups, that this is an implication, but come on. So, okay, there are different uh, notions of reconstruction, all of which have they are on right, they're all interesting, depends on the context, which one you, you are interested in the most. It's also not so important now to remember if you have never seen this, this is of course a lot of different concepts at the same time, it's different but similar concept. So you will probably not remember all of them. It's not so important. But, um, can I ask one question? Yeah. When you say bijection, you imply, does it preserve something or it's just a bijection of sets? Well, to, I, I mean, yeah, to define this, I just needed to be a bijection, yeah? So it's just induced. Um, well, for example, uh, in my paper there, we, we have the, this is the same as by definability between the structures. Yeah. So actually this bijection witnesses by definability. But I here is more abstractly thinking of reconstructing the permutation group structure, right? Yeah. So, yeah, uh, I those... mean, it's, this bijection, like if it, if it's not uh, if it's not an isomorphism, it, it will never uh, work, right? Or well, it might be a bidefinability. Of course, there could be structures with different uh, signature, for example. 
uh, by default. Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course. So this is this is this is. I mean, model theoretically, this was actually yeah. the interfere paper because by the final bit is much okay, more yeah. stronger than by interfere bit. It's like they are essent. They are really the same structure. Right. Uh, right. Really. I mean, that that's uh, that, that's really the answer. I mean, uh, so here we we don't. Uh, I mean, B doesn't even have the same signature, so we cannot we cannot compare them. Yeah. But up to up to like. Um, Defi definability, um, it's, uh, I mean, if, if we expand in both structures by all definable relations, then uh, this will be an isomorphism, right? Yes. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, but yeah, here, as abstractly as I write it, um, no, this is, ju it just comes from a bijection, but then obviously the mapping is continu uh, continuous. Yeah. Um, okay, so those are the different notions, and here are all, <laughs> not, not all, yeah, but some results, yeah. So um, this might be a, a, a bit shocking, but uh, I don't ask you to to look at all this table, yeah. Uh, I already, it took me a long time actually to to do all this research and to, nice, to, nice. To do this. Yeah. And maybe maybe I, once it will be complete and and correct because I'm not sure about all all uh, references here, yeah? not about the statements, but all references. If it's always really the first one. Um, uh, maybe I will print a poster because it there are a lot of results in the history. Yeah? And uh, it is difficult to keep track here yeah? because you have well. So we have three three uh, kinds of objects: automorphism groups, endomorphism uh, monoids, and polymorphism clones. And we have four uh, notions of reconstructing the topology um, that I just presented. And then, as you can see, a lot of our favorite omega categorical structures uh, have this kind of uh, whatever kind of reconstruction, okay? Now, um, what is notable? So first of all, if you look, um, these automatic continuity results, they're from the 80s, yeah, uh, most of them. Um, so uh, they are much earlier than anything below here, yeah? So it all started with groups yeah, in the 80s, automatic con continuity, okay? Then basically there came a, a second a new method, yeah, um, by Rubin, by Mati Rubin, um, for which allowed to to reconstruct the action of a, an automorphism group, um, and which also gives automatic homomorphicity. So uh, he had this different method proved uh, that uh, that a lot of structures have uh, have this uh, kind of reconstruction. And then a unique Polish topologies. I think this is uh, so the, for the full symmetric group automorphism group of the empty structure. This is uh, from the 70s, yeah? This is what I mentioned before. There's a unique uh, Polish topology on the full symmetric group. And then uh, I'm not sure, yeah? Maybe somebody, uh, some of you know more structures. I know that uh, also the rationals have it and the random graph. And I think this only in the end follows from, um, from these more recent works of Kechris, Rosenthal, and Rosenthal, Solecki. Um, uh, but uh, I might be mistaken. Yeah? Okay, so but anyway, there's there's a, the, this is like the the third kind of kind of thing. Yeah, so automatic continuity, then Rubin's method, and this. Okay, how about monoids? Um, so actually, we started as I said uh, eight years ago. I had my first contact with this topic coming from constraint satisfaction problems. We studied this. Uh, and we obtained automatic homomorphicity for the random tournament, for the uh, endomorphism on it of the random tournament, the random graph, and uh, the the uh, like the, the monoid of all injections, uh, which doesn't have a unique Polish topology as we saw before. Yeah, so this it has this, but not this. Yeah. Um, and then, so we basically invented a kind of technique for this, and uh, and then this technique was improved by uh, by other people, and uh, it was proven for many more structures. Okay, and what I'm talking about today, or what I'm going to talk about in the in the second part, is well, uh, what you can observe is there were all these here uh, for the weakest notion, basically, of reconstruction, and there was no automatic continuity, and there was no unique uh, Polish topology. Okay, and actually we thought. 
automatic continuity is impossible for monads. Yeah? We thought, uh, I will give you some negative results that, that made us believe it. This we thought it makes no sense for monads. It only works for groups. Uh, but as it turns out, as we found out now, uh, it actually it actually works. So there are a lot of uh, structures, random graph, random digraph, random equivalence relation, whatever, that do have automatic continuity, whose uh, monoid or clone have automatic continuity, um, and uh, also unique Polish topologies. Yeah. So when after the example before of the monoid of injective functions, which has infinitely many Polish topologies, you could think, well, okay, this just doesn't work for monoids. Such a simple monoid doesn't doesn't have it, but uh, in fact, many many have it. Yeah? Um, so these those are the new results with one new method uh, that I'm going to talk about in the second part. Yeah? So um, uh, uh, only one thing I wanted to add about this table is that uh, the difference. I mean, this this might look strange to model theorists. So, uh, so if I look at the, par this is the random partial order P. Yeah? I look, always look at it with the strict order, non-strict order, yeah? or Q here, rationals, strict order, non-strict order, which doesn't happen for uh, for automorphism groups, of course, but this doesn't make it a, a huge difference for uh, uh, monoids, yeah? if you preserve. I mean, otherwise, you have constant functions, for example, here. You have constant functions, constant endomorphism, which uh, makes the reconstruction problem in general much easier. Um, okay, so this uh, was the first part. Um, is this right that there's a, a break, or that we can take a break, or that a break is desired? I think it wouldn't be bad. Oh, yes, uh, after one hour, I think yeah. uh, it's good to have some break. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you're the organizer, so you, you say how long the break is. <laughs> it's always a problem. I don't know, five minutes? Enough. Well, for for me, it's fine. I don't know. Yeah, yeah whatever the, we usually do, I don't remember. Maybe five minutes. I don't know. Every time we do something minutes. different, okay. probably. <laughs> okay. And now. Okay. okay, let's do five minutes then. Okay. So see you. See you okay. Five so do you? We can talk. In the. Okay. 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 Uh, can we start? Yes. Okay. So this was the grand table. I hope uh, you remember all of this because there's an exam at the end. And um, <laughs> now uh, there will be the second part where I just uh, describe uh, some methods for proving this, which are probably more interesting than the results themselves. I mean, then, uh, having this table, it's nice, but it's nicer to know why why uh, this, this this actually works. Yeah? Why is the topology so often determined by the algebraic structure? So first, uh, I want to give some counterexamples um, to show when it doesn't work. Um, I want to just uh, mention a few methods uh, for groups that, that exist. Um, I wanted to mention some old methods from Monet clones that we used back in two, uh, 2013. But I think I'm going to skip this uh, because anyway, it's old and there's a better method now for the new results. Um, called property X, um, and I'm going to see how this works. Okay, uh, let me start with uh, counter examples. So we've seen uh, that the monoid of injective functions, which is the endomorphism monoid of, of the non-equality relation, uh, has infinitely many Polish topologies. But actually, uh, I mentioned this with the table, it, it does have automatic homeomorphicity, okay? Okay, so the uh, unique Polish topology can fail badly. How about of automatic homomorphicity, which is the, the um, weakest notion of all these? Um, well, it can also fail, yeah? So there exist uh, omega categorical structures with uh, isomorphic automorphism groups as groups uh, and uh, whose uh, automorphism groups are not isomorphic as topological groups. Okay, this is Evans and Hewitt. Uh, in 1990, and we we managed to construct uh, such things also for endomorphism monads and polymorphism clones. Yeah, but the thing is, uh, they are very not natural at all. Yeah, 
So while it is difficult f to prove for your favorite, but, uh, can I ask? Uh, do you get? Do you use the axiom of choice here, or you get yes, better? you do. Yes, yes, you do because yes. because you have the small index property consistently without C. So and so, then you always have automatic continuity. Sorry to have a uh, step. Yeah, so for groups, you definitely have to use the exam of choice, yeah, because otherwise you, uh, it, it, this, this, this is cannot, you cannot prove this, you, show, you, can, you need it, yeah. For monads and clones, I don't know if it's needed, but anyway, we do use it, we actually use the structures they use, yeah. Uh, you use the the same structures, but a, a variation there. Or... Yeah, we, we have to we have to change it a yeah. bit because yeah, it's not exactly that, yeah. because the, the funny thing is we want to use their structures, and uh, so more or less we want to expand their isomorphism to the endomorphism monads. Okay, um, but it's very difficult to expand it because it's not continuous. <laughs> yeah, so no. so actually this very the very reason for this example makes it very difficult to. I see. To so interesting. It, yeah? see. But but you can do it, and um, and uh, yeah. So we also use the exam of choice. It's not natural at all. These are at all these are horrible structures. So while it's while it's difficult to prove even for one structure, say the empty structure or the random graph. That it has it, yeah. It's also very difficult to find a, find a counter example. Yeah, this is. Uh, Does it have to do with the profinite groups of some kind? Yes, yes, the, yes. Profinite. In fact, there are very hard problems on profinite groups. Like there is this. Yeah. Uh, yeah so I, this, I've considered some uh, myself. So profinite so, groups yeah. that are encoded somehow in automorphism. Yeah, that, that's a problem. In fact, there are uh, even on the R measure of these groups, there are problems. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, but anyway, this exists, but it's very difficult to achieve. Yeah. Um, now, for as for automatic continuity, uh, it fails very easily, very very easily. So uh, let me state for, uh, the following observation: If A is an omega categorical structure, then the monoid of embeddings, yeah, so which preserve strongly preserve the relations, um, but which don't have to be bijective does not have automatic continuity, any embedding monad. So, and why is this? Because, well, within the embedding monad, you have the automorphism group. And, uh, well, whenever you compose an embedding with an automorphism, it's going to be not an automorphism. It's not going to be surjective. Yeah? So, so these things, they are algebraically very well separated. Yeah? Um, but, uh, but they are topologically not separated at all, yeah, because uh, I mean, the, the closure of the automorphisms in the bare space in n to the n is going to contain non surjective functions, yeah, always if A is omega categorical. Yeah, so, so these topologically, they're not separated at all, yeah. So, what you can do is you can map these to the identity, these to some constant function, and um, then uh, this is a homomorphism, but it's not, uh, it's not continuous, yeah. Okay, so uh, in particular, the endomorphism monad of the rationals does not have automatic continuity because the endomorphisms are with the strict order, because the endomorphisms with the strict orders order are just um, are just embeddings. Yeah, it's the same in that case. Okay, and actually, with a similar trick, you can show also with the non-strict order, the endomorphism monad does not have uh, automatic continuity, and that's why at this time. The 2013, when we started, well, I deleted this uh, There were no uh, automatic continuity results, yeah, because um, we thought this makes no sense for monads. This just doesn't just doesn't happen. Yeah, um, well, we we were wrong, and I'm going to show you some uh, why it, why it does happen sometimes. <laughs> But before that, um, let me just uh, highlight uh, some of the groups, the, uh, some of the methods that exist for groups. So uh, the automorphism group of a structure has a small index property. If every subgroup of countable index is open, okay, I say countable index, some say um, uh, less, less continuum, less than continuum index is open, okay, which is the case if and only if every subgroup of countable index contains a pointwise stabilizer of the, of the group yeah, by finitely many elements. Okay, and this is uh, uh, easy uh, to see, um, uh, to be equivalent to automatic continuity as I defined it, okay, and, um, and this is the method uh, at the time in these many automatic continuity results that were in the table 
um, they proved uh, that the structures have the small index property to show that they have automatic continuity. Um, there's a strengthening of this uh, that uh, Gianluca uh, uh, used with uh, Scheller, um, which is the following. Uh, it, uh, the automorphism group has the strong small index property. Um, if every subgroup of countable index is not doesn't just contain a pointwise stabilizer, but is between a pointwise and a setwise st stabilizer of a finite, finitely many elements. Yeah? Um, and uh, this property, you can show it, that many structures have it. Yeah, this didn't feature didn't feature in the in the table, but they showed it for many structures. In particular, I think if you have free amalgamation, right? Um, yes, that. well, it's a relational language, and if you're a relational language free amalgamation, yes, we, yeah. yes. Um, and this, uh, from this, you can get uh, something better, you can, or a uh, uh, difference, say, uh, action reconstruction within the class of omega category structures with no algebraicity and the strong small index property. Yeah. Uh, then a completely unrelated method that they actually want to compete with, as Gianluca just <laughs> told me, from the 90s of uh, Mati Rubin, where for all exists interpretations, which uh, were more or less an interpretation of the structure in its own automorphism group, yeah? um, and which, which can, you can use to, to get uh, automatic uh, homeomorphicity and action reconstruction. Yeah? So that's how um, this uh, many results uh, here were obtained yeah, on the action reconstruction and automatic homo homeophysicity. So completely different method. Yeah? Um, the, a nice idea of, of interpreting a structure in, in, in the group, yeah, in, in the, the algebraic group, uh, it's automorphism. Okay. And uh, finally, I would like to mention ample generics. So uh, the automorphism group has ample generics. If it's action on uh, finite powers of itself by conjugation has a co meager orbit. Okay. And uh, if you have that, then you have a unique Polish topology and you have automatic continuity uh, with, respect, uh, with respect to a larger class than just automorphism groups. You have automatic continuity with respect to. Um, uh, separable uh, topological groups. So uh, that's a very uh, uh, nice um, method uh, so for proving automatic continuity and more. Uh, for example, the random graph has it. Uh, and uh, Kechris and Rosendahl were the ones who showed the, this implication here. Uh, not so long ago, yeah, compared to these older things from the 80s. This was 2007 or so that the paper appeared. Um, okay, I, I'm going to skip the old methods for monoids and clones because anyway, they're somehow subsumed by the newer ones and I don't want to talk forever. Um, so let me straight go to the new method. So as I said, uh, we had no automatic, we thought automatic continuity for monoids was, was useless. It just doesn't work. It doesn't exist. Um, and, um, then the semigroup theorists started to study the reconstruction problem of the topology for abstract semigroups. They came up with this simple property that we actually managed to verify for a lot of structures. It's called property X, and I hate them for this because, well, <laughs> I mean, you can come up with a better name, and it's a very intuitive property, actually. So it's not even, you know, just a horrible property that you cannot describe in nice words. But well, I couldn't convince them to change the name. So what is this property X huh? uh, definition? So let S be a topological semigroup, okay? And let A be a sub-semigroup, okay? So it doesn't have to be a subgroup, uh, just sub-semigroup. Um, then S, the, the big group, has property X with respect to the smaller uh, semigroup inside. If every of its elements, S, can be decomposed in this way, okay? And what is this way? It's uh, two elements from the semigroup and in the middle, one from the smaller one, okay? Okay, so this, uh, in a monoid, this, uh, <laughs> this decomposition always works. You take, uh, uh, you take the S itself and identity, identity, yeah, but, um, but we want more. We want in, additionally that for every neighborhood, 
of the function from this uh, smaller set, from the smaller group, uh, if you vary this function in this in the neighborhood, yeah, if you wiggle it around here um, and compose it with the two functions that you use to represent s, then you get a neighborhood about s. Yeah? So um, it's really uh, very simple. It's a kind of topological decomposition property. You write every element. You want to write it as a, a composition of three things. Yeah, two from the big bigger semigroup and the, the middle one from the smaller one. And with the property that if you start varying the, the, the middle one uh, within its smaller semigroup openly, then you get uh, something open around S. Yeah. OK, so you can fill out. Uh, you don't have any holes around S. OK, so uh, not so not so difficult, actually. And uh, and it's a very useful for the following reason. There's the following theorem that is uh, simple, yeah. This is not a, do a difficult theorem, yeah. So they they prove the following. I mean, I hope they don't mind me saying this, but it's it's not hard to prove. Um, if you have a semigroup and a, a Polish topology T on on the semigroup, and you have a sub semigroup A, such that you have this property X, then you have two things, yeah. If the sub uh, semigroup is actually a, a Polish group, okay. So if it happens to be a, a group and the induced topology is a Polish topology, then the topology on S is a maximal Polish topology on S. Okay, so it cannot be contained properly in a Polish topology. And the second thing is, for this you don't need the, the smaller semigroup to, uh, to be a group. If it has automatic continuity, then um, also the big one has automatic continuity. So it doesn't matter which A you choose. Um, no, just it doesn't any, really matter. No, you just have to find one sub semigroup. Yeah, you, you just have to find one. And uh, I mean, usually, and, usually, so in applications, this will usually be the automorphism group. Yes. Yeah, that's the question. I I even considered that paper where I was studying something completely different. But I think I have this kind of phenomenon, which that's, where I have the automorphism in the middle. They, they, they also use it for abstract semigroups. Yeah. So then it's not always, uh, you know, an, there's maybe not a the natural the natural group inside or so yeah, um, of course. Right. It's, so 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 in, in several natural cases it happens for a the automorphism group. Is well, the actually, in all cases, I know when you look at when S is the endomorphism on it of a structure, then A is the automorphism group of that structure. I see. Okay. And you consider all endomorphism, not now, not 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 the monomorphism, not the embedding. Yeah, yeah all all endomorphism. Okay. Um, okay, and uh, so I don't have time uh, to prove it, but it would actually be no problem to prove it. This is very, very easy uh, uh, to see. So basic, basically, like, well, what's the reason? The reason why why can this be maximal? Well, if you have another topology that contains it properly, on A, these two topologies coincide, yeah, because uh, they are they are uh, Polish groups, yeah. And um, and since they are contained in one another, they, they are the same, yeah. Because what we know about uh, Polish topologies on on groups, yeah, they must be the same, yeah. And and then this property X, it somehow it it allows you to create uh, in every open set around S uh, uh, an open set in with respect to the other topology uh, uh, around S, yeah? and then. Then they are the same. Yeah. So this, it's really very simple. Um, okay, and the, and the automatic continuity lifts. But for the first one, you don't even know, have to know that this has automatic continuity. Yeah? Okay. So a, a corollary of this is if uh, the endomorphism model of a structure has property X with respect to the automorphism group of the structure, then the pointwise topology. Uh, uh, equipped with the pointwise to, uh, topology, of course, then the pointwise uh, 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 topology is is a maximal Polish topology. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and a remark: it is often very easy but, to show. Sorry, that there could, there could be other Polish topologies, other maximal Polish topologies. Yeah. Yes, I'm not. I'm sorry, not saying largest. I'm just saying maximal. Yeah. Okay. However, however, it's often easy to show that the pointwise convergency is the smallest Polish topology, okay? This is often very, 
very trivial somehow. Yeah. Um, uh, so just elementary uh, uh, stuff, and and you see that the point wise must be the smallest one. Okay. And once you know that, and you have the property X, what do you have? You have that it's the unique Polish topology. Yeah? So that's that's how it works. Yeah. So you, for elementary reasons, this is the smallest one. Then you show this property X. This is usually a lot of effort, and then you show you know it's a unique Polish topology. Okay. Uh, let me uh, just give. Um, some examples of the property X. Um, uh, we take the natural numbers with equality. So the endomorphism monoid is just uh, the bare space, yeah? the, all functions, and the automorphisms are just the bijections, symmetric group. Okay. Now for every function uh, n to the n, we want S, yeah? so this goes from here to here. We want to decompose it into three parts. First we apply F, then we apply a bijection, then we apply an automorphism, which is just a bijection, and then we apply another uh, function g. Okay, so how can we do this? Well, it's uh, very easy actually here to verify the property x. I mean, you just take f to be injective, yeah, with a co infinite range. Okay, this g, you take it uh, generic, surject, uh, obviously, it has to be surjective, yeah, so you, um, you just take a surjective function with infinite classes. Okay, and then obviously you can you can uh, find a, a bijection uh, here that that moves the elements exactly in such a way that the composite is S. Yeah, this is not easy and uh, not difficult. Yeah, and uh, also if you if you now take a neighborhood of this bijection, yeah, so you fix finitely many points, then this this doesn't have any because there's no structure here. This doesn't fix any other elements or so. Yeah. Then you will still get an entire neighborhood of S yeah, by by moving moving it around. This is very easy to see. Um, okay, so uh, G has to be surjective because in every neighborhood of S there's a surjective function. Yeah, this is uh, 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 clear. Yeah, so um, so this has to be surjective. This you you take it just injective and co-infinite range, so that you create as much space as possible and that you don't lose any information. And then you do this very easy back and forth, elementary. Yeah? Um, okay, and it follows that uh, the pointwise topology is the uh, maximal and in fact a unique uh, Polish topology in n to the n because it uh, because of this easy fact, every Polish topology contains the pointwise. Um, how about uh, the random graph. This is more more difficult. Uh, just uh, I just want to tell you what, what what one does is one takes G again to be a surjection, okay, uh, which is generic in the sense uh, well you build it as a phi C limit, okay. Let's say the random surjection that is an endomorphism. F you take an embedding. The, such that the complement, uh, the, all types are realized everywhere. So this is kind of a random embedding, yeah. Also as a fancy, but but not uh, it, no. It's actually not completely random. You you do it in such a way that no parameters from here define a subset here in the range that you couldn't define with uh, finitely many parameters within the, the range. Okay, so such a kind of independence from the complement of the range you need. Okay, so I cannot tell you now exactly why, but if you do it this way, then uh, then you can write S as such a composite and with the property that if you move around this uh, in an open neighborhood, then you get an open neighborhood here. Okay, and uh, it's always uh, you you I mean in all proofs that we have, we we construct these two things, and then this one is always uh, back and forth. A non-example, just to show you how it can uh, go bad. So this this works because the random graph is so free, yeah, and and because the, the empty structure is so free. Uh, a non-example is the the order of the rationals. Um, why doesn't it work? So it, the order of the rationals doesn't have property x with the, uh, the endomorphism doesn't have property x with respect to the automorphism group. Why is that? Um, well, if you take any endomorphism. That is not surjective. Okay, so it has a point outside the range. Okay, uh, in its in any neighborhood there will be surjective functions. Yeah, so G again has to be a surjective. Okay, so there is something going to that point that is not hit by S. Yeah, 
Okay, so alpha uh, maps this um, uh, maps something to that point that is mapped by G to that point that is not in the range of S. Okay, and now if you take a neighborhood of alpha where this point is fixed, yeah, uh, where the image of this point is fixed, that means uh, this is fixed, this is fixed, and that means that any um, if you look at the pre-image under F of, of, of everything that is below this point, then it will have to be sent uh, in any composite of this form below Q. But no neighborhood of S will know what is below Q and what is above Q. You cannot say this with a pointless topology. Um, okay, so, so here the property X really fails. Yeah. So once again, Q, like without homospace groups, that it doesn't have the ample generics, it fails the, the easy yeah, yeah. technique. Well, it, so. it is with this kind of uh, problem, yeah, the f more free the structure is, uh, the, the easier it is. Another question, uh, concerning the random graph, do you actually use formally some notion of it, I mean, the notion of independence in the random graph? Uh, well, we don't use it, uh, so I no, maybe, maybe hiddenly you use it. Have you, so, have yeah, you considered so, this? Because almost, this this would allow for the proof to go through in a whole lot of cases. yeah. So yeah, it would actually be interesting to know if uh, what we do uh, combinatorially. I mean, some concepts they look uh, kind of as they must have appeared already in some other arguments, but uh, yeah, I. I didn't use any, uh, we didn't use any, any uh, things like uh, formal independence or so. Okay, so, um, so this just very quick, um, the, that this, uh, this, this can't work for Q. So we don't actually know if this has a unique Polish topology, yeah? but in any case, it doesn't have a uh, property X. Okay, now let me just uh, state the sufficient conditions for a property X that we isolated. We need homogeneity, so A is homogeneous if every uh, partial finite isomorphism of A extends to an automorphism. We need to be homomorphism homogeneous, so every partial homomorphism extends to an endomorphism, finite, finite partial homomorphism, okay. Uh, we need a strong amalgamation property, okay, strong, strong amalgamation, meaning that if you have set finite substructures that look like this, um, then um, you can embed this without identifying anything between the, these uh, structures C and D, but there can be relations. No, I'm not saying free amalgamation, there can be relations between these elements. Um, so now, and... what is the difference, sorry, I got lost. What is the difference with free amalgamation? Uh, free amalgamation, you are not forced to add any relations. Right. Well, in this case, ah, in this case, there might be. So it's just disjoint amalgamation, maybe another name. Uh, yeah, okay. some people say okay. disjoint. Okay. Okay. Fine. Some people okay. say disjoint. Um, yeah. So uh, Q Q has the strong amalgamation, but not free, obviously, because you have to have some yes. relations. Mm. Uh, okay. So these are classical things. This is not so classical, but easy to understand. Uh, the only uh, bit strange thing is. It uh, that we invented, yeah? I don't know if this exists somewhere, it has the strong amalgamation property with uh, homomorphism gluing, if it has the strong amalgamation property and uh, in this amalgamation diagram, so this structure that contains this diagram, whenever you have a homomorphism from this structure to another structure, uh, a, a mapping from this structure to another structure, such that restricted here it's a homomorphism, and restricted to, to D, it's a homomorphism, then G is already a homomorphism, okay? So er, any relations, you can think about it like this, any relations that hold here, there might be relations, but they are implied, they are really implied in a unique way um, by, by, what, by the relations here. So if there are no relations here, if you have free amalgamation, then this is, is the case, yeah? Then uh, if, if, if this here, if here you are a homomorphism and here, then on the total thing, you're a homomorphism because there are no relations here, yeah? But uh, for example, the, the rationals, they have a strong amalgamation with homomorphism gluing because, okay, you might, there will be some relations that hold here, uh, actually, no, not the, not the rationals, but the, um, the, the random partial order. Yeah? 
you might uh, have to compare some things here in the random partial order. Yeah. So if if this is smaller than this and this is smaller than this, then you will have that that this is smaller than this. Yeah. But it is determined in a unique way. Yeah. So any homomorphism that uh, that uh, any mapping that is a homomorphism here and that is a homomorphism here is automatically automatically going to map this uh, below this one. Yeah. Because it must map this below this and this below this, yeah. So um, yeah, it is it is somewhere between uh, disjoint uh, amalgamation, as you say, and free amalgamation. Okay. Yeah. In the case of automorphism groups, this we 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 somehow consider. In fact, we call it canonical amalgamation. That in many algebraic cases, in fact, ah. you have this. Really, so, but I, I should I should now I should take my feedback, but I, I I think so. Yeah, the, the okay. but, yeah for automorphisms, of course. No, the, yeah, but the, uh -huh, yeah, but this would be very interesting still to have. Uh, I think so. We call it in fact canonical because even if you have tournaments and stuff, you might need to add stuff, but still the automorphism. Mm -hmm. and this connects with the stationary independence as well that I've been mentioning. Yeah. Essentially, well, I, I must say I I suspect yeah, that that there are some uh, things. No, but we don't consider homomorphisms. Yeah, yeah but, but, but even if there's the corresponding concept for automorphism, uh, it's it's better to to. I mean, you can still use stuff in in, in general, yeah. And uh, it's better to have a reference or also for the name and so on. Yeah. Okay. So uh, as I said, if you have free amalgamation, you have this this uh, very strong <laughs> amalgamation. Let's say a strong amalgamation with homomorphism gluing. Yeah, in particular for the random graph, random digraph, and so on. The random post set, as I said, uh, has it. Yeah, because well, you 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 will be forced to add something, but only something that is somehow implied in a unique way. When you do the amalgamation, the the random equivalence relation, infinitely many classes, has it. Um, uh, however, for example, the rationals don't have it. Okay, the rationals are always bad, but also the random tournament. Yeah, the random tournament is quite free. Yeah, it has of course uh, disjoint amalgamation or a strong amalgamation. It doesn't have free amalgamation because between any two things you have to have an edge. Yeah, and it doesn't have this homomorphism gluing because well, if you do the amalgamation, you will be forced to add some edges here, but you don't know how. Yeah. I mean, this is not somehow implied by the edges that you have here uh, in which direction they, they should go. This is, you don't know what's going to be there. And uh, you can have a mapping yeah, from this tournament to another tournament that is homomorphism here, homomorphism here, but violates the relation in between. Yeah, so this is a, an example of a, in a sense, very free structure that, that fails this. Yeah? Uh, okay, so and the theorem is well, these are exactly the, oh, not exactly, these are sufficient conditions, the best sufficient conditions we could find for property X. If A is homogeneous, homomorphism homogeneous, and has this kind of amalgamation, then the anamorphism monoid has property X with respect to the automorphism group, and uh, therefore the pointwise topology is the maximal Polish topology. Now, in many of these of these cases. We also know it's the smallest Polish topology for uh, trivial reasons, and therefore it's the unique one. Yeah, so this is how we obtained it. Um, um, uh, may maybe it's uh, fun uh, to just mention the endomorphism monoid of the rationals with strict order has at least two Polish topologies, with which is it more or less inherits from these many topologies. Um, on the injective monoid, monoid of all injections. Yeah? So it, it, it can also fail, yeah? it can also fail. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, and for clones, um, you don't, uh, I'm, I, I don't say much about it. It's really the same, as, as I said, the step from groups to monoids is much bigger than from monoids to clones uh, because, yeah, the, the loss of the strong group structure is, is a much bigger loss. Yeah? So for clones, you have a similar theorem, um, homogeneous, homomorphism homogeneous, strong amalgamation with homomorphism gluing, same as before. And you need, in addition, that the, the age, the finite substructures of A are closed under finite products. You know, so this, this is what comes from the arities, higher arities. If you have these conditions, then 
the polymorphism clone of the structure has property X with respect to the automorphism group. And the pointwise topology is the maximal Polish topology. Okay, so that were all the results I wanted to present. Um, we applied it then, of course, to the random graph and so on, as you saw in the table. In the table, I have uh, uh, two open problems. Um, the endomorphism monoid of the rationals with the non-strict order, does it have a unique Polish topology? This is, uh, it doesn't have property X. This is what I explained very quickly before. I think it's a very nice problem because, well, I mean, it's just a set of all monotone functions on the, on the rationals. I mean, it's not some, something very uh, exotic, yeah? <laughs> so we should uh, know if it has a unique uh, topology or not, yeah? Um, so this is open, um, but if you decide to work on it, please talk to me because I'm also working on it. <laughs> and also my student, Clemens Schindler, is working on it. <laughs> So, um, but uh, this is I'm, I'm very interested in. So we, we, we try to do a uh, generalize the property X and so on to, you can do stuff. We know something about the possible uh, topologies. We, we found out a lot, but we don't know yet if it's unique. And um, uh, this is of course uh, an open problem from the classical model theory world, uh, the automorphism group uh, of the, the random partial order uh, does it have automatic continuity? As far as I know, this is still open, which is uh, shocking, yeah, uh, considering this huge table that we have. Recently, something has been proved like, that it has, uh, doesn't have two or three generics or something, I think. Aha, uh -huh, okay. So, so neg negative, but... No, I, uh, yeah, I, it doesn't have ample generics, I think. This, I mean, yeah. I, I saw a talk, I don't remember where. Okay, so, this yeah. is, so it is like this year or last year. No, what, wasn't it even in, in Oberwolfers with somebody? Ah, maybe, maybe it was. Uh, uh, maybe it was. No, I don't remember. But something uh, appeared on, on this. Okay. So. Anyway, so as far as I know, it's... it's yes, a, yes. No, no, I, I also think that. There was uh, it's partial. still an open problem if it has automatic continuity. Um, I mean, this is such a nice structure. And, Absolutely. Uh, and so even uh, like uh, triangle-free graphs, uh, universal graphs, or uh, uh, hypergraphs, and this stuff, you, you you didn't prove it yet, or did you? Uh, no. So actually, uh, if you ask, for example, about so hypergraphs, it's going to be the Easy. The same proof as same graph. As random graph yeah. Right, but uh, for example, a KN free graph, KN free graph doesn't have um, doesn't it's not it it has this strong amalgamation with homomorphism going, but it's not homomorphism homogeneous. Yeah. This, ah, hey, in fact, this also this I don't have much intuition. I see. So well, so I, yeah. Of uh, uh, homomorphism homogeneous, so you you're given a, already a partial homomorphism. You want to extend it. Now this partial homomorphism in on on the KN free graph, it can add edges, right? I see. Yeah, so and then uh, and then you are in trouble. You cannot expand this anymore. Mm -hmm. So this this doesn't have this simple yeah, property. Also actually. Need, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, but. Uh, the, okay, these are just sufficient conditions for proving property X. I yeah, of course. I don't know if it has property X. Yeah, I mean, I know for a fact that Q doesn't. The rationals don't have it. But uh, this, I don't know for a fact if that it doesn't have it. So uh, it could still. Yeah, because once again, Q is very different in the classical theory yeah. and from other these or the other structures that are so, essentially yeah. like the random. Somehow, I mean, this decomposition. Uh, uh, this is. I mean, it's not. Well, uh, it it could also fail. Yeah, in the, in the case of the KN free graph. Yeah. Um. So I don't know. Yeah, uh, I didn't put it here. I don't know. Uh, I haven't proven it for any structure that I didn't mention on on this uh, big table. Right. Okay. Um, okay. So these these are open problems. And of course, if you prove uh, automatic continuity for the for the random partial order, then it follows. It, it is going to follow, in my opinion, by. Uh, uh, yeah, it it is going to follow for this yeah? because of the property X. Ah, and this, but this is very specific to this case, or what are you using? Sorry, I'm lost. Uh, property X, yeah. So um, there's the, the one statement that if the group has automatic continuity. Ah, no, yeah, uh, because you already proved property X for this. Uh, yes. 
Yeah. I see. So you proved poverty X, but there is this big problem. So uh, yeah. of course you are stuck. Yeah. Okay. So, so um, yeah. So these these are just some, but of course there are many, uh, uh, many many problems. You just have to look at the table, and you will see that <laughs> that it's of not uh, not complete. Okay. Thank you very much. That's all I want to say. Uh, and uh, I put the table here for <laughs> any questions or remarks. <laughs> Yes, so this was very nice. So I have, I asked maybe too many questions, but I have a last one. So in the past, I, I consider automorphous groups to some extent and stuff. Now I move to a billion group theory and I see there that endomorphous monoids are really very important there. So I wonder what about some classical abelian groups, even divisible or certain kind and stuff. Do the endomorphism uh, groups of these abelian groups have been studied in this kind of uh, context? Um, so I don't, uh, I don't think so. Um, um, it's okay. Just, uh, it's just that uh, I mean, endomorphism on any abelian group theory. You have a lot of information and stuff. So, uh, yeah. nice so um, I mean, in this, uh, when they uh, came up with this property X, uh, they did consider some some uh, particular examples. Yeah, um, but. Yeah, I'm. I, I'm not sure now. Yeah. So. No, no. Okay, it was just well, a question. Uh, if you knew, it's, uh, it's, but, I mean, you already know so much that. Uh, uh, but, but yeah, uh, I mean, uh, if so, there are now uh, just um, two papers on this. Yeah, and the, the very first one where this property X was introduced, which con considers various semigroups. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the ours, which is not online yet, actually. Yeah. Ah, yeah. So, okay. so uh, send it to me when you write that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and in their first paper, so they 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 check it for for various uh, monoids. Yeah. So okay. I'm so not, they I'm, might have I'm not, sure, or... I'm not sure which one now. All right. I will look at it. Um, okay. So maybe some some of those that you're interested in are do appear there. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any other questions? Mm, seems not. So, well, let's thank the speaker again with the weird Thanks chocolate lot. thing. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. Yeah. Um, okay. I, I put the slides on, on my website. So, if you want to. Mm -hmm. Uh, in fact, I wanted to ask. Okay, so yeah. they are in the website. So, um, uh, I, I know you recorded it uh, anyway, and you can use it uh, however you want. <laughs> and you can also use the slides. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. So, okay. as the. Sorry? Please. No, no, please. Yeah. No, so I mean, obviously, there was a lot of stuff now and. Uh, uh, I had to go fast over some some things. Um, in, yeah, if you're interested, you can look at it in uh, absolutely more, uh, more in more relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> well, but you gave a lot of information, so it's a good job. Okay, so as the to renew this seminar, we meet again next uh, Friday as usual, same time. And next time there's going to be Victoria Gitman from New York. She's going to talk about uh, virtual large cardinals. So, uh, goodbye. Okay. Uh, so, good Friday. Okay. To